Hi, this is Major League Baseball umpire Hunter Wendelstead, and you're listening to Out of Left Field on the Grueling Truth Network. Hey, guys, welcome back to Out of Left Field. Graham and Chris back here with you from the cheap seats to the diamond seats. Thanks for hanging out with us again here on the show, brought to you by the Grueling Truth Network, thegruelingtruth.net, where the legends speak. A lot to get to this week. Let's go ahead and get right to it. Put, put the ball in play and uh, – I don't think that there's really a whole lot of surprise here that uh, the show is going to start off in Atlanta. What happened last night between the Braves and the Marlins was, as I told you, brother, the, the biggest load of Bush League horse bleep that I have seen in Major League Baseball maybe, maybe since the Rangers brawl with the Blue Jays. I, I, mean, I, I mean, we see our fair share of, of junk, you know, what happened with the Dodgers and the Giants recently, but this whole thing start to finish is just it's a load of crap you have Acuna has hit eight home runs in his last eight games he led off three straight games with a home run um two of those games were obviously were a back-to-back doubleheader on the same day and I believe the final two dingers that he hit in those uh leadoff rolls uh were on the first pitch and as and the last one two days ago was a great pitch it, it, it wasn't, you know, it was a great two-seamer down and in, kept his hands in, dropped the barrel, and drove it out to left center. It was, you know, he just beat the pitcher. He did his job. And the pitcher did his job. Sometimes you just don't win, and that's okay. But the way that they go about solving this problem was just really, really classless by an extremely young and immature team. Yeah, and what what kills me about the entire situation is that – Acuna didn't do anything wrong in any of these at bats. He didn't he didn't hit a home run, flip his bat, airplane around the bases, jump up and down on home base, point at the pitcher, point at the wall. He didn't do any of that stuff that you would typically consider to be a negative thing for for a player to do in this situation. Something that would get him hit, right? He didn't show the pitcher up. And yet Urania took it on himself, or so we're told, he took it on himself to go ahead and, well, pitch inside. And Urania's defense is that that's how he approaches right-handed hitters. He always throws fastballs inside to right-handed guys. Sure, but uh, do you always throw fastballs three feet inside? Because if you have that little control over your fastball at 97 in the first pitch of the game, you would know that by now. Like, you would have known warming up. So the problem I have Kid with it. Kid music exists for a reason. Right. This was not that. This was just, I'm going to stick it to someone who has been beating us. But you and I aren't the only people who don't understand what Acuna did to deserve this. Right. Ted Berg, he's a writer for USA Today. He writes in the uh, uh, for the win column, uh, says the Marlins' first mistake was thinking Ronald Acuna Jr. feels pain. And then later said, also, did I miss what Acuna did to piss the Marlins off? Because if the Marlins are just going to start plunking dudes for being better than them at baseball, only the Orioles are safe. So – it's funny, you know, I see you laughing on the screen there. It's funny. It is funny. I think maybe the Red Sox are pro- or the, the, excuse me, the White Sox are probably safe as well. But he's got a point. I mean, realistically, all that happened was Urania was afraid he was going to get beat. And if your first thought as a pitcher is, man, I better hit this guy before he hits the ball over the fence, maybe you don't belong in the big leagues. And unfortunately, not everybody is approaching this with the same, I guess, I, I mean, I, I guess I, I don't want to say clear point of view because I get there's always two sides here. But former Met and, and well, really uh, uh, Seinfeld uh, famed Keith Hernandez decided that he was going to open mouth and insert foot, and he is getting absolutely lambasted right now. I don't know. I, I sent you this. Did you see the comments that he made? Oh, yeah. So Hernandez said on a broadcast, quote, they're killing you. You lost three games. He's hit three home runs. You got to hit him. 
I'm sorry. People aren't going to like that. You know, you got to hit him. Knock him down. I mean, seriously, knock him down if you don't hit him. You never throw anybody's head or neck. You hit him in the back. You hit him in the fan, close quote. Absolutely one of the the most airheaded, just just clueless, dense quotes that I have heard coming from a former major leaguer. And, and I get you can say the old days. The old days don't matter at this point. E- even then, the old days, this is, this is junk, hot or not. And, and, and Peter Moylan, uh, Braves reliever, said on Twitter, this is just next-level BS. The kid is playing the game with joy. He needs to be hurt for being great. You're a clown, Keith Hernandez. Uh, and and this, is, this is the interesting one. Chipper Jones, Hall of Famer, chimed in, mentioned Jacob deGrom. He and DeGrom are very close. Both went to Stetson University out here in Deland, not too far from me. They're good friends. And, 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 and I, I like that Chipper uses this to bring home the point. And the point was, he said, so by this way of thinking, Jacob DeGrom should get drilled because he's the hottest pitcher on the planet? No. Enjoy watching him pitch. And I enjoy watching uh, Ronald Acuna Jr. play the game. I'm old school, just like this broadcaster. But these comments are way off base, close quote. He's exactly <laughs> Right. This is the dumbest thing I've heard. And actually, the Marlin, the former president of the Marlins, is now CBS uh, baseball analyst, responded directly to that Chipper Jones quote, saying that Chipper Jones should know better. Uh, you don't hit a pitcher. Chipper Jones should know better. He's old school. He should know better. He should also know that if a guy's playing well, and this isn't a direct quote, this is a paraphrasing, but if a guy's playing well, he can expect to get to have a little heat coming his way. Let me ask you this, though. Uh, you're going to hit Acuna because he beats you three times or four times in three games or whatever it is. And, and you think that's okay. Correct me if I'm wrong. Did, did, did JD Martinez get plunked by the Dodgers after his four home run game? How about Josh Hamilton? Did he get plunked? by Baltimore after his four home run game or Scooter Jeanette, did he get plunked by St. Louis after his four home run game? These guys hit four home runs in a single game. You don't hit a guy for that, right? You say, Hey man, you beat us four times. So why are we plunking a guy for hitting four home runs in a series? Immaturity. And and, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. So we have said that this, this Marlins team is, is incredibly young. Right, incredibly young. Uh, JT Real Muto um, and Martin Prado, probably the biggest named veterans on this team. Justin Bohr got traded to the Phillies this past week. You've got a guy who, and I'm not sitting here trying to go ahead and defend Urania. I think he, I, th- I think what he did is is indefensible and it's stupid. But what I think this kid is trying to do is ingratiate himself to his to his ball club. He's a young starting pitcher. He knows they've been, you know, getting knocked around. Hey, I'm going to send a message. I'm going to fire up our guys. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to go ahead and, and keep on just owning us. And you hit it. But this kind of comes back to that same feeling between Strickland and Harper. It, it, it was – now, granted, this, this scenario is less personal than that one was. But basically what you have is one pitcher deciding to take justice into his own hands because he has a baseball. And everyone around him is going, what the hell are you doing? So now if I'm JT Real Muto, I'm kind of hacked off because I'm assuming I'm probably going to wear one the next time the Braves play us when they come to our place, which, oh, by the way, when the Braves come down to your place in Miami, that is when Urania will be finished with his six-game suspension and his next start will be against the Braves. I will ask you this. I know, I know we're, we don't want to, to beat this to death. But I'll ask you this. If he actually loses control of a pitch and hits a Braves player in his next start, what happens as a player? Do you try and sit back and go, okay, it's dead, it's over, that's not part of it? Or is the bad blood still going to be sitting there you know, you know, do you go ahead and start playing Taylor Swift on the loudspeakers and just ring the bell and it all goes to hell in a handbasket? Well, it depends on the situation, I think. 
Yeah, on the one hand, you got to think, okay, is this connected? But at the same time, if he hits the number seven hitter on the third pitch of the at bat, and you know the number seven hitters lead the inning off, and it just happens to be a bad pitch, crap happens. If he hits Urania, uh, Acuna at any time, yeah, I think the bench is clear. I I really will be interested to see. Oh, if he hits Freddie Freeman, I think the bench is yeah. clear. Even Marquez. Yeah. Uh, and Marquez is a very quiet guy. Um, I will be interested to see how the umpires handle this because we saw what happened with, uh, obviously, the you know, with Syndergaard and Utley and that when we had the ejection and all that. I, I will be curious to see if if they give the Braves a shot um, and if they do, if the Braves choose to take it. And, and, and by the way, kudos to those umpires in the game last night for making the decision to eject Arena. Obviously, Brian Snicker had to get ejected. <laughs> you, you know you've done something wrong when the guy who rushes the mound after getting hit isn't the guy who got hit. It's the manager of his team. Because I think that if four umpires and two players weren't all faster than Brian Snicker, that Brian Snicker might have hit Arena. Yeah. I mean, he was that angry. I love it. I, I, I love the fire because right now this is a ball club who is fighting. They are clawing. They are trying to find their way to hold on to an NL East, which will, as of today, at 24, when the Mets hang 24 runs on the second place Phillies. Granted, it's one game and things happen, but that's kind of funny. But I, I love the passion. I love it from, from a, you, you know, from Snit, seeing him come out there like that. I think it was awesome. It was what he had to do. And you see a little bit of, oh, well, the umpire should have ran him right away. No, I love what Paul Nauert said to crew chief. He said, hey, we wanted to get together as a crew, make sure we were all on the same page, which we were. We all judged there to be intent. He had to be ejected. We tossed him. Mattingly was just angry that they didn't toss him right away. And that's fine if you want, if you want to say that. But at the end of the day, when you have that big of a, 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 of a fracas, you know, yeah, Chad Fairchild could have come out and just immediately ran him, and maybe should have, kind of like what Adam Hamry did to Syndergaard. But at the end of the day, it, it, I mean, the benches were moving pretty quick. At that point, you're just trying to keep it from getting too crazy, and then you work it from there. They did a great job. They made the right call. Really, really, really good job by those guys. This is one of the moments when you can say you hate umpires, um, but you got to give them a credit. And I'll tell you this right now, robots couldn't do that. No, no, and they wouldn't do that because they can't the, – an electronic umpire is not going to be able to judge intent, and that's, that's the key behind this whole thing. Arrhenia needed, needed to get hooked, and kudos to the umpires for doing it. And I'm happy. I don't even, I'm not even upset. A fine, I, think, I think Major League Baseball did a great job. I'm not even upset that it took them so long. Because I think they needed to have that conversation. I think just the home plate umpire can't go, yeah, I think there was intent. He needs to talk to everybody on the crew and say, what did you see? Because what, from what I saw, he threw at it. Agreed. So, no, I think it was great. So, uh, to go from one pitcher to another, uh, one young pitcher to one long in the tooth pitcher. So, let's just – let's change leagues. Let's change age brackets. Let's change tax brackets. Let's change rotation. Oh yeah, actually, I think yeah, we do. Yeah, we've got, we got to change uh, uh, rotation placement because uh, Felix Hernandez is now the king of the bullpen. And see, and he just made his first re- relief appearance uh, the other night. From what I, I didn't, I didn't look at the box score. From what I understand, he did pretty well. Uh, pitching out of the pen, but that's his first relief appearance in 301 game appearances over the last, uh, oh, excuse me, his first relief appearance in in uh, in his career, excuse me, and if I'm, if I'm Felix Hernandez, part of me is so angry right now that I got moved to the bullpen but it's a tiny, tiny part of me. And the rest of me is like, you know what? I've got a f- plus five and a half ERA. What is it? Five, seven, five, six, two, 
He started 23 games. He was 8-11 and 11 with a 5-6-2 uh, ERA. Uh, had given up 81 earned runs. He had walked 48, uh, which, I mean, he, he was on, on pace to set a career high and walks 101 strikeouts. I mean, you know, has hit 11, so we know his command isn't there. I mean, really, the, the scary thing here is just how, how far – his numbers, you know, I mean, really his numbers dropped and they dropped a pretty significant amount when he's got a whip of 1.42, the highest in his career um, by, by a, a pretty decent margin. Yeah. And so um, he's over his 14 year career, the guy started 398 games and now entered one game as a reliever. This is first relief appearance in his career after 398 starts. You got to think that part of him is going to use this as motivation to do well in the pen, because I don't think he's ever coming back to the rotation. No, I, 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 I agree. I mean, I mean, we have seen, at least since 2015 when he was 18 and nine, uh, it's just gone down from there. The, the ERA has continued to grow even from 2014, when it was a 2.14 ERA, the next year he was 3.53. Then in 16, 3.82. Last year, 4.36. That was only in 16 games started. This year, 5.62. I mean, it, the n- numbers are growing, but they're the wrong numbers to be getting higher. Um, right. And, yeah, it's one of those things where – and we discussed this, and I think it's why it, – to me, it's what makes Justin Verlander so good is Verlander learned between the injuries that he had and and he still has the ability to turn the gas up and just blister the corners of the plate. But he has now a devastating slider, a great changeup. He has pitches that allow him to to mix in that fastball when necessary and and still let it be an effective weapon. We just haven't seen that same kind of stuff from Felix Hernandez. He still is a guy who wants to blow it past you and he's not locating his fastball in ways where he's blowing it past guys. Guys are waiting for it. Guys aren't scared of him the way that they unfortunately used to be. And because of that, uh, you know, I mean, he's just – he's been getting knocked around the yard. Right, exactly. exactly. And, and, and we know – I mean, this is not an easy transition. Let me look – now, granted, Sonny Gray has – I think is going to end up going down as one of – he's that pitcher who had – a ton of great talent, but it never really showed itself, even in Oakland. But he, in going to New York and they've moved him to the pen, that's not even working well. Sonny Gray is just it's just not working for him in the big leagues. But kudos to the Mariners for making that tough choice, uh, you know, for moving him, you know, you know, for, for moving him out of the rotation. Because man, I mean, this is a ball club right now that we both know they legitimately have uh, a a really really good chance to make it in, in the playoffs. I mean, it, it it is not inconceivable that they could win their division. I don't I don't see it right now, but it could certainly happen with the way that things are happening in the uh, in the American League West. Right. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, speaking of what's happening in the American League West, and I think that's a perfect way to sort of transition into this. There's a lot going on in the American League in general. Uh, but the American League West is shaping up to probably be one of the most exciting divisions in the, in, in this league. Uh, I know you do the American League, but I'd just like to say real quick, um, when you're 30 games, 29 games above 500 and 10 and a half games out of first place in your division, you got to sit back and go, what? Yeah. So – I mean, the Yankees, the Yankees are playing great baseball, phenomenal baseball. But can anybody beat Boston? Man, it doesn't look like it. I mean, I mean this is – I mean, th- this is a scary team. You know, I, I mean I, – you know, and, and, and the, the irony here is we've completely already forgotten that they had no hit this year. They got no hit. Right. I forgot that they would gotten no hit this year. Oh, my gosh. By, yeah, by Sean Mania. 
you know, I mean, it's just they're, you know, they're eight and two in their last 10, um, I mean, 42 and 15 at home, 44 and 21 on the road. Um, you know, we saw them play against uh, Philly. It's been a pretty good series. Philly took them last night. The Sox won it the night before. It's actually been kind of fun to, fun to watch. Um, but, you know, they have really managed to do well. And, and the scary thing is, you know, you know, you look at, you look at the overall rotational depth this team has. Price is still there. Obviously, they moved Pomeran to the pen. Rick Porcello is pitching extremely well. He is he is very close to that Cy Young level that he had two years ago when you and I predicted it. Remember, our, when, of course, our buddy Adnan Burke kind of gave us a little bit of, uh, you know, a, a little bit of uh, grief for picking him as our Cy Young winner, and then lo and behold, he took home the damn hardware. So then, hey, yeah, exactly. credit, he owned it. But he is pitching back to that uh, to that level again. Plus, you have Chris Sale, who's pitching at an entirely different level. Yeah, exactly. Um, does Does Chris Sale think that there's a a level of play above Major League Baseball, and that if he continues to play in this way, he's going to somehow get uh, called up to that? level or is is he operating under that false assumption i think him and degrom think there's another league that they need to get called up into there's just something i i, I want to say that to, i i think that you'll really um i think you'll appreciate this statistic <laughs> all right not really a statistic but this fact the boston red sox have 36 losses that's the same number of wins as their division makes the orioles and also the kansas city royals The Royals are 36 and 84, and the Orioles are 36 and 85. Um, Moving on. Yeah, I got nothing. I mean, what do you? I'm nothing really. I mean, what do you say? So I I, I just (laughs) there was a. We are looking at, at a at a real possibility here of – and I, I want to say it's the first time, at least in my lifetime, that we could have two 100-game winners out of the same division. One of them – I mean, we could have a 100-game winner that doesn't win the division. Normally, if we see three, it's always division leaders. Of course. What really blows my mind is not only could we possibly see a 100-game winner that doesn't win their division, but we could see a 100-game winner that doesn't come out of the wild card game. Because... And you say that, and, and I know you kind of, people kind of laugh. Well, you know, well, come on. I mean, the Yankees are going to beat the A's. And they're they're going to beat the Mariners. They what? might. But, but what happens if, if Houston continues to stay four and six and keeps dropping ball games, and it's the Yankees and the Astros in the wild card game? A, it'll be the highest. It'll be, it'll be the most watched wild card game in history. I, I, I mean, it, it's yeah. – you talk about just wanting a one-game playoff. I mean, that, it doesn't get much better. I mean, that's <laughs> – it'll change the entire landscape of the American League postseason, uh, but it, it would be awesome to watch. But we have to at least give some love. And, and I, I mentioned that the, the A's are only two games out of first place behind the Astros. And you got to give some love right now. Uh, you know, the – it's it's still a tight race all the way around. The Phillies two and a half back of the Braves. The Brewers uh, are three back of the Cubs just by virtue. They have more losses. They've played, uh, I believe they have played four more games. They are 68 and 55, whereas the Cubs are 69 and 50. So really just kind of just some percentage points there, not by much. And then uh, you still have three teams within a game and a half of first in the West. The Diamondbacks hold the lead, but the Rockies and the Dodgers both tied a game and a half out. Uh, and then, hey, your Giants, man, they're sitting at 500, but they're five and a half out. Um, 
it's it's kind of crazy to think five and a half games back of your division, and yet they're a half game further out of the wild card. I mean, it's just just the way this whole thing has worked is just kind of its own little. It, it's it, it's such an odd season. How we thought this was going to be a year where most divisions were going to be wrapped up so early, and we've only got two divisions that are wrapped. That's it. And the thing that's killing that kills me about the fact that we've only got two wrapped up divisions is that the it's two of the divisions that we didn't really think were going to be wrapped up. We thought the Yankees and we thought the Yankees and the Red Sox were going to be boxing it. Yeah, exactly. And we thought Houston was going to be so far ahead of anyone else in that division, even if one of those other division teams made a run at a wild card spot. I don't think any of us saw Oakland two games back. And I'm going to be a hundred percent honest with you about that American wild card game. I don't know that if the Yankees go into a game against Oakland, that they come out of it. Not the way Oakland's been playing. Because and who's to be starting? honest, because Severino's been has been rough. I mean, who do you have start that game? And we saw Severino struggle uh, in uh, in the wild card last year against the Indi- or against the um, the Twins. Yeah, and but let's put this into perspective a little bit. We're talking about Oakland's only two games back of Houston. Houston's only one game back in New York. So we don't even know that that wild card game takes place in New York. Sure. So and I think the question, really, the question is going to be in the AL West and the National League East and the National League Central and the National League West, who's going to close it out? Who is going to close it? And that's a question that, while it's really important for a lot of teams, it's really scary right now for the Dodgers. Because their closer, the all-star Kenley Jansen, is out right now on the disabled list because of a an irregular heartbeat issue that he is having. He had to actually uh, have his heart shocked with a uh, with an AED to go ahead and get the rhythm back to what it should be. He's expected to be sidelined for about a month, which puts him obviously into September by, by the time that he comes back. Um, I mean, it, it's not something that we take lightly. Granted, yeah, we want to look at this from the perspective of what does it mean for the Dodgers. But first and foremost, our thoughts are, are, are with, with Jansen to make sure that he gets back safely and is able to be healthy so that he can continue to do what he wants and he can, you know, he can just live a life without having to worry about, hey, you know, is your ticker going to mess with you a little bit? Right, exactly. And, you know, of course, we all wish speedy recovery to Kenley Jansen. Um, this is a big deal. And Kenley Jansen said that um, he might have to have a secondary surgery done on his heart in the offseason. And, and who knows how that's going to affect him from there. Um, it's called a heart ablation or cardioversion. And it's a procedure that corrects rhythm problems or arrhythmia right which is what an irregular heartbeat which is what Jansen went down on the on the DL4 Um, but according to the Mayo Clinic uh, cardiac ablation scars or destroys tissue in the heart that trigger a normal heart uh, abnormal heart rhythm so it's a it's it's a orthoscopic surgery it uses catheter sorry it's a catheter surgery right so it uses catheters which are inserted through uh, through veins or arteries in the groin and then threaded up into the heart and uses hot energy or cold energy to modify the tissue to, to fix the arrhythmia. It's not considered to be uh, a life-threatening uh, surgery or a dangerous surgery, but you know, when you're having surgery on your heart, who knows, who knows what might happen? I mean, it, it could be anything. So yeah, I, um, we, we talk in this show a lot. We do a lot behind you know, the scenes and a lot of prep prior. But next time, can you just give me a, a heads up that you're going to mention catheters and veins through the groin before you just kind of bring that up? Because that, that, that caused me a little bit of, of, of emotional anguish. But you said that, I'm just sitting here, and it's like, yeah, I, I, it's just, I'd appreciate that. Sure, sure, I'll take that into consideration next time. 
which means you're going to leave me hanging and just drop it on me in the middle of the show. Oh, yeah, I thought that's what I just said. <laughs> well, I mean, it, and this isn't the first time, like you said. Uh, he did have, had to have heart surgery following the 2012 season, trying to solve the problem. Obviously, it didn't. Um, granted, Jansen was in Colorado at that time, so the altitude could have played a factor into that. Um, so it, it, it seems confident uh, as of Saturday – uh, it said that he will be out until at least the 20th of August. So four more days. That's what Dodgers president Andrew Friedman said, and they will reevaluate him. So maybe it'll be a shorter stint, uh, no pun intended, than uh, you know than, than a longer DL stint. But um, you know, I, I mean, I, I certainly hope that it, he will come back. That's a big piece for uh, for the Dodgers. I mean, if they they're a team who they've been struggling offensively this year and they need you know I mean they need him there I I don't want to say the heart I don't want to say the heartbeat of the team I'm looking at the at the headline and I'll see his heartbeat but I mean you want Jansen there someone who can go ahead and pick you up get you guys through uh you know the heavy part of that ball game uh and put a W in that column so so again our our thoughts with him hope that uh, that he gets better and is able to return to the team very right Absolutely. And, it, you know, it's interesting that you say that that, um, that the Dodgers are a team that's struggling offensively because it's absolutely it's absolutely true. Um, Why are you surprised? And, I made an accurate statement. It's what I do. It's it's not so much that I'm surprised you made an accurate statement. It's just that I'm surprised that your cognizance isn't enough to recognize it. Um, but I wasn't. You just told me that's why I grabbed on to it. It's absolutely true, and nothing nothing makes nothing is more obvious than to that fact than the fact that Yasiel Puig is well. He's being Yasiel Puig every time he swings and misses at a pitch pitch he thinks he should have hit. He does this thing now where he, he kind of throws his bat and then grabs the handle and whacks the top of it. And people don't like that, which is understandable. Like, you're basically telling the pitcher, no, I'm better than you. I just didn't get it. Bryce Harper has – we've had the same discussion before we began the show, a couple of years before you and I began the show. Harper used to – you know, he used to, you know, cuss out loud. Well, he still does that. But, you know, he'd miss a pitch, pop it up, he'd yell, he'd slam his back down. And guys finally said, dude, knock it the hell off. All right, you're professional, so are they. You're going to win some, they're going to win some. Get over it. It's the game. And then it's a point where, you know, how well can you control your emotions? And according according to Nick Hundley, that's exactly what he said to him. You know, hey, listen, man, there's no call for that. Just, you know, get back in the box. Just get back in the box. Let's continue this at bat. There's no need for you to lose it and, and 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 try to show up the pitcher by smacking your bat or whatever. And Puig apparently took, well, he apparently took uh, issue with what Hunley said to him. And they jaw jacked at each other for a second, and then Puig pushed him and then slapped him across the face with an open hand. Uh, Hunley was wearing a mask, obviously, at the time. Slapped him across the face with an open hand, causing both himself and Nick Hundley to be ejected from the game. Puig suspended two games, fined. Hundley not suspended, but also fined. And the bench is cleared, obviously. Right. And you know, the what's interesting is the first base coach for the for the for the LA Dodgers sort of pulled Hundley off pulled Hundley back and back and back and back. And then they kind of lost their balance and tumbled and it kind of looked like he tossed him. Right. And uh, Hundley came up to the top of the top step of the dugout after this was all over and uh, went over and talked to him and said, you know, or the guy looked at him, he goes, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't trying to tackle you. I was just trying to get you out of the situation. And Hundley tipped his cap at him, said he understood and walked back in the dugout, which shows the class of a guy like Hundley, as opposed to a guy like Puig, whose own, who's on uh, one of the one of the bench coaches of his own team is trying to get him to stop and he's shoving the bench coach back and right. throwing his hands up yeah the get and, and back to much here kid. is not so much you know i don't have 
as big of a problem with the with the reaction of Puig to missing the pitch. Because if you see a, a pitcher give up a home run or mislocation, they've got no problem screaming, yelling, whatever. But it, it's one of those moments where – it's one of those things that, that because of, of Puig and who he is, um, you know, I, I think that, that every little thing – kind of gets exacerbated because of that personality. Right, exactly. And it does because everything that Puig does is under a microscope, especially after he got sent, sent down, right. uh, what was it, last year or the yeah, year before? So. Was it 16 or 17? He got sent down, and it was basically his attitude and his, his ability to play as a teammate, not necessarily his ability to play the game. I don't think his hustle is questioned in any way. Right. Uh, but his ability to be a good teammate, his ability to be a, to make smart decisions through his anger are what got him sent down. And here we go a year or two later and, and he's in the same spot, acting the same way, making the same mistakes. And I, I think it's not so much what he's doing. It's how often he does it. Right, we see guys get a big hit. You remember in 2016, you know, the, the big moose ears with the Royals because of Moustakis, you know, or you see the guy, you know, you have the eye, the glass, you know, whatever, you know, the, the, the chef, I mean, whatever little thing that a team is doing, a, a hitter will do it, or you'll see a pitcher get fired up and start yelling, you know, and they get a good strikeout to end the inning on a big, you know, in a jam, stuff like that. There, there is room to show emotion. He just does it so often that I think at some point, like, all right, man, look, you've, you've, we give you a little bit, but it's time to go ahead and find that balance. Right. Right. And he does it. He does it in the wrong way. Right. Agreed. Um, Love the heart. And I think that's what, I think they all love the passion, but you don't love the way in which he, um, he, he lets that be, be seen. Right. Exactly. And I don't think, I don't think anybody does. I, 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 it's not just, it's not, not just his teammates, but you got to imagine that, that fans and other, other invested parties are looking at what he's doing and saying, you know, I don't want my kid to think that that's something that's okay. I don't want my kid to see a big leader do that and and act like a child and act like a spoiled, you know, a-hole. I'm not going to bring my kid to the game anymore because I don't want him to. I don't want him to see Yasiel Puig. Right. And now, now you're costing the, the team money, right? Guys, so. plenty more to get to uh, next week. Uh, Mariners reinstated Robbie Cano. We are really interested to see what they're going to do with him because they've got him for about another month and a half. That's it. He's not going to be postseason eligible. How do you use him? How do you? How do they use him to get themselves in the best position to be one of those final, hopefully, five teams in the American League standing in October? Exactly, and not only that, um, where does he go? What, I mean, in my opinion, right now, home. the way that home, well, home at the end of September. <laughs> what I'm saying, what my opinion right now is, the only place where he really fits is at the DH role because you don't want to interrupt what the Mariners are doing defensively, they're doing quite well. And I, I just don't think he has, I I really don't think he has a place. They've been playing so well without him. Why disrupt that by, by trying to shoehorn him in what I'm really interested to see uh, aside from the Mariners that I, that I think we'll probably have a bigger sample size to talk about when we get back next week is how Wilson Ramos does in Philadelphia probably breathing a sigh of relief right now because he basically has gone from worst to first, not exactly worst to first, but the Tampa Bay Rays are in no position to make a run at the playoffs. Whereas the, the Philadelphia Phillies absolutely are in a position to make a run to the playoffs. And I think Wilson Ramos is going to be a big part of that. If, if he can become more consistent. He had a great first day. Um, like you said, we're going to see what happens uh, with him, we want to get a better sample size. You mentioned Cano. Maybe they try and look at doing a, a platoon type of DH between him and Nelson Cruz. I'm not sure uh, if they want to do that, but obviously Cruz getting a little bit older. It could be a fit. We'll see what happens there. Plus, maybe not next week, but coming up, it looks like Sandy Alderson will not be returning. 
to the GM role of the New York Metropolitans. Who do they find, and what can that choice mean for guys like DeGrom, Syndergaard? Is a rebuild in the works? Should they have moved players now? Do they wait for the offseason? What is going to happen in New York? The one thing we know, unfortunately, it's not going to be Tebow time. All that plus 15 more days for the waiver trade deadline. Adam Jones of the Orioles has cleared waivers. Will he be moved? Will he waive his no trade clause? We'll find out in the next 15 days. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. Be sure to check out thegruelingtruth.net. Fantasy football is back. Football is back, baby. It is week two of the preseason starting tonight. We are excited. I know our fantasy draft is in a couple of weeks. I'm ready for that. Trying to figure out a good team name. Uh, We will let you know what it is, both Chris and I, if if we get one that we think is actually suitable for young ears. And if it's not, we'll just tell you the nice ones we thought of and and actually use. Hang out. Check out our Twitter page as well, at OO Left Field. Of course, our show page, Out of Left Field with Chris and Graham on Facebook. Thanks so much for hanging out with us, guys. Always appreciate it. For everyone here at the Growing Truth Network, for Chris, I'm Graham. We'll see you next week back here on Out of Left Field.